When I take something home from a flea market or a garage sale, it's often pretty dirty. I'm here today to show you what I do if I get something that's totally filthy and I want to save it. Today I'm going to go over my methods for cleaning up old video game systems, testing them and making sure they're ready to use. But if you've ever been to a garage sale and left something behind because you didn't think you could save it, hopefully today's video is for you. For now, let's get going. So today I'm going to do this with uh, some ColecoVision parts. ColecoVision is a big favorite of mine. It was something I had as a kid. I really loved the ColecoVision. The games were awesome. And the people who made the games had to make do with the Zilog Z80A 3.58 megahertz CPU, 16K of video RAM, and 16 on-screen colors. <laughs> Somehow they made games that are pretty fun. I'm not the kind of guy that can just leave a ColecoVision sitting around. If I see a ColecoVision in trouble, it's dirty, it's getting ignored, it's sitting in a moldy basement somewhere. I'm the kind of person that'll pick it up. There are ways that you can connect these to modern day television sets if you're willing to put up with a little bit of futz. But most importantly, when you find one and it's dirty, there's lots of ways you can clean it up. Today I'm going to go over my methods. They don't have to be yours. Uh, there really is no right or wrong way to do this kind of thing. There are some good practices and some poor practices. We'll go over those today, but let's face it, there's no real expert in the field of cleaning 40-year-old electronic equipment that has sat in a moldy basement for 35 of those years. Lots of ways to go about this, I'm going to show you mine. So the first thing I do when I pick up an old piece of equipment at a garage sale or a flea market, I take it outside, out back, and I make sure to wipe the outside of it down, just so I can touch it. Oftentimes you don't know where these things have been, they may have been exposed to all sorts of stuff. Some of that stuff may be hazardous, there may be stuff inside you're not expecting, I usually wear gloves while I'm doing this. So once the exterior of the game system is clean and I can touch it, I feel reasonably comfortable with it, you might think the next step is plug it in, turn it on, see if it works. That is not my next step. My next step is to make sure that it's unplugged and then to open it up and do an inspection. You flip it over, you take the screws out, you flip it back over, lift the top off and take a look. I'm looking for a variety of things. First thing I want to check, are there any bugs inside? It's rare that you find living insects inside of old electronic equipment, but it's not impossible. And if you're going to bring this into your house, you'd like to know that first. Typically bugs don't live in old electronic equipment. There's really no reason for them to do that. There's no moisture, there's no food. It's just not a great or hospitable environment for most insects. So most of the time you're safe. Occasionally I find a dead bug inside of an old computer or stereo. You just clean it up and get rid of it. But beyond bugs, which really isn't the big issue. I'm looking for any signs that there are serious electronic problems with this piece of equipment before I plug it in. Is the point at which power comes into the unit black, singed? Does it look like it burned at some point? Are there any capacitors that are bulging or leaking? I'm also going to check the AC cable for any fraying, and I'm going to check the power supply to make sure that it's outputting the correct voltage. In this case, this is a ColecoVision. It's kind of easy. It tells you right on the transformer what each pin should be outputting. Unfortunately, it's not labeled as to what pin is what, but I know. So up here in the top left corner is the ground. So I'm going to take the black probe from my multimeter. I'm going to put it in there. And then this pin up here should be plus five volts. So in goes the red probe and I get about five volts. That's not bad. And then down in this corner, this pin should be negative five volts. I put the red probe in there and I get about negative five volts. That's great. And over here, the hardest to get one because it's closest to the ground. This one should be outputting 12 volts. And as you can see, it is. So this power supply is safe to plug into this console. It's working mostly the way that it should. An old power supply like this has really old components in it. And those components, once you start using it again, can fail. It's not a bad idea with any piece of vintage electronics to replace the power supply completely. But if I'm just doing a test, it's not a very expensive piece of equipment. I'll typically use the old one after I've tested it just like this. So now is the point where you can plug it in, turn it on and see if it works. In this case, as you can see, it does. It's outputting a picture. It's outputting a picture to the RF port on the back of my television set. For those of you who are unfamiliar, all video game systems from this era combined picture and sound into one cable and put it into your television through the RF port. It's kind of like the system itself was broadcasting a signal that the cable input of your television would read. This was seen as convenient for consumers then because, as I say, it combined video and audio into one cable. You didn't have to split them up. You didn't need more than one cable. It just all worked. And that was how your cable went into your TV anyway. So it seemed like a no brainer at the time. These days, as fewer and fewer television sets have these little screw mounts on the back, 
it's starting to seem like a bit of a pain. But as long as you have a TV that has this connector, you can play an old video game system. It'll be a little fuzzy, it'll be a little snowy, but you can play it. There are ways to modify old video game systems so they will connect to other connections in more modern television sets. I'll go over those methods in a future video. But for today, I'm just gonna clean this up and use it in its native form. So the next step is to separate the PCB, the printed circuit board, basically the motherboard inside the system from all the plastic. The plastic is gross, it's pretty dirty, it's seen 40 years of grunge and grime and basements and garages and who knows what. So I gotta get them separate so I can soak the plastic parts. After it's soaked a while, I'm gonna scrub it. So you can use any kind of brush you want. You wanna be careful of any paper labels, that kind of thing. For the most part, this particular console doesn't have any paper label on the outside of it. I'm not too worried about that. There are some some vents which have molded ridges over top of them. That's a pretty hard spot to clean so a brush is a pretty good tool. You can use any brush you want. The bristle brush from a shoe cleaning kit is a pretty good idea. A toothbrush can be used too although it's a little small. These days I'm really in love with this particular brush. I bought this at Lee Valley. It's a brush that's intended originally for preparing surfaces before surgery. It's literally meant to scrub your skin. It's got a bunch of little bristles that get into the vents really well. It's pretty gentle on plastic. Obviously it's meant to be gentle on your skin. And it's excellent for getting off stuff that's kind of stuck on there and that doesn't want to let go. Anyway, once I'm sort of satisfied with all that, give the plastic a rinse. And then it's off to take a look at the motherboard, the cartridge slot, and all the electronics connected. If the board is dirty, and sometimes it is, then what I would do just as a general cleaning method, I would put a little bit of isopropyl alcohol on the end of a natural bristle paintbrush, a clean one, not one that has ever been used for paint. The wet brush with the IPA on it sort of serves as a dusting solution and a cleaning solution all in one. I use 99% IPA because that evaporates really quickly. I like using 99%. We can buy that here at any uh, pharmacy in Canada. I'm not sure about where you guys live. Every country has different rules for that kind of thing. But yeah, we can buy it at 99%. I always buy it at 99% and then I'll cut it with distilled water if I want to. I often keep a spray bottle around where it's half distilled water and half 99% isopropyl. So I guess it's like 50% isopropyl. And then I can just spray it on anything I want to clean. It's an excellent cleaning tool. It cuts through grease. It kills germs. It's a really excellent cleaning tool. Next onto the switches and uh, the cartridge slot. So for switches, if there is a switch on the system, I would find the hole in the back of the switch and I would hit it with a little bit of Deoxid D5. If you wanna know about Deoxid D5, I have a video on that. I'll put a link to it for you here. But basically it's a contact cleaner. It will clean the switch, but also protect the switch. So once I get all the switches clean, then I have to turn my attention to the cartridge slot. Cartridge slots in most video game systems <laughs> face up. <laughs> That means gravity pulls a whole lot of junk down into them. And you can find all kinds of crazy stuff in there. If the system's really dirty, you gotta get some contact cleaner into that for sure, no question. I'll spray some Deoxid D5 in there, particularly with a cartridge slot. I love the way the Deoxid D5, the 5% of the Deoxid, stays behind and protects the cartridge slot in future. But if it's really, really dirty, you gotta get a tool in there to clean it. I've seen a lot of people create tools out of plastic, like uh, uh, gift cards for stores, that kind of thing. I have found that a tongue depressor works best for me. I measured the width of this tongue depressor and I found it to be 1 16th of an inch, which coincidentally is the exact width of the PCB of a ColecoVision game. They're exactly the same width. So I wrap a tongue depressor in a Kim wipe. If you don't know what a Kim wipe is, I've got a video on that. Put a link to it for you here. And after spraying the dioxide into the slot, I gently push the tongue depressor into the slot and work it around a little bit by little bit and clean the slot up and down, up and down, up and down until I'm pretty satisfied that it's clean. You can see the corrosion you're taking off just by looking at the Kim wipe when you're done. In this case, there's a fair bit of corrosion I removed, so that's good. And so then the basic cleaning is done. At this point, if I was keeping it and I was gonna use it again and again and again, I might consider replacing all the electrolytic capacitors. I would definitely consider buying a new power supply, making sure that my video game system got fresh, clean power from something that wasn't 40 years old and on the verge of death. But this system, as it sits right now, could be used reasonably safely, in my opinion. And so I'm gonna just make sure that all the parts are dry, make sure that the deoxid is had overnight to dry, and make sure that it's not still pooling up in the bottom of the cartridge slot or somewhere on the board. If it is, I'll make sure to sop it up. But then once everything's dry, I'll put it all back together, and I will reassemble the system. And then I will feel really good. <laughs> Because there's nothing quite like saving something that might have ended up in the landfill had no one else bought it at the garage sale. And let's face it, like, how many people are going to put this much effort into cleaning up an old ColecoVision? That system's best chance? Probably me. <laughs> 
So I'm really, really glad and happy when I can get something going and it works and it looks like it's gonna have a life moving forward. I think that's the best feeling ever, especially when it's something cool like an old video game system. There are some bones of contention here. A lot of people might wanna polish their system, polish the plastic. You hear a lot of people talk about using Plastex or um, armor all in order to buff the plastic up and make sure it shines. I don't recommend either of those methods. I've tried them both. In fact, I contacted Meguiar's, the company that makes Plastex. Plastex is a, is a buffer for clear plastic. It's typically used, I bet your mechanic would probably use it on your headlights if they start to yellow because it will buff the yellow out of clear plastic. It'll make scratches go away from clear plastic. It's very popular in the audio community for buffing up the dust covers of turntables. It's excellent for that, but it's not meant for use on colored plastics. And if you use it on colored plastics, you can make the plastic kind of cloudy. I have used it with some success. I'm not saying it never works, but the company themselves told me don't use Plastex on colored plastic. It might damage the plastic. And as far as uh, Armor All goes, it's a really great way to sort of rejuvenate plastic. It's meant for car interiors, that kind of thing. But the biggest problem to me is that it creates a situation that's kind of sticky on the surface of the plastic. It might not feel like it to your fingers, but here I'll show you a little bit here. I put a little bit on the back of this housing and watch what happens when I dump a little bit of baking powder over top of it. It sticks. That's not good. I don't think you want to have a video game system that draws dust quite like that. It's just gonna end up dirty in the end, but it actually could start sucking dust into your system. And I don't think you want that. You just cleaned it. So I never buff the plastic. I always just let the plastic shine. It wasn't buffed up when it was new. It was just clean. And so to me, a clean system is exactly the kind of system I wanna have. So I don't mess with polishes or buffs or anything like that. I just leave it like this. And then, well, that's when the gaming starts. You invite your friends over, you crack open some beers, you play a little Moon Patrol. That's what you do. So there, I hope that helped you out. If it did, please feel free to like or subscribe. Liking a channel like this or subscribing to a channel like this can really help a channel like this. And if you could do that for me, I'd really appreciate it. And otherwise, take care, have fun with your DIY projects, good luck at the garage sales, and I'll see you next Saturday.